Well, thank you all for coming today. This is wonderful to see such a wonderful crowd here for our first, uh, not only of 2018, but our first combined seminar for the LEAD Center and the Department of Epidemiology. I'm going to pass it over to Priyana Kumar, who's going to introduce our wonderful speaker. Please. Um, thank you all again for being here. And this is uh, Cheryl Packner. She's here from Colorado State University. She also has a, a secondary appointment with the Colorado School of Public Health, a um, professor of epidemiology. And she's here to present some of her research on environmental exposures on chronic disease epidemiology. So, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Just put that. There. Okay. Um, happy first day of the semester. Uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces here. I appreciate coming to the talk. So um, this is kind of a very broad overview of research that's been going on for oh, the past five or six years. And I had fun finding images on Google Images for a mixtures talk. Okay. So just very briefly to give you an overview, a roadmap of today where we're going. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my early thinking about how, how to handle multiple exposures in epidemiology and then current thinking about mixtures. I'm going to talk a little bit about traditional epidemiology approaches and um, talk about three case studies that I'd like to present today. One, looking at specifically air pollution mixtures. Two, looking at agricultural mixtures. And three, looking at lead and social factors. And then just talk about some conclusions, open it up for questions and discussion. And I hope to have a really fruitful discussion with um, this good sized group, thank you so much. I feel very welcome. Okay, so I am um, trained as an asthma epidemiologist um, probably for the last, gosh, now 15 or 16 years. I've been doing the same thing, and I've really been answering the same question over and over again. And I'm not sure if that's a lack of progress or a sign that I just come up with a really good research question. So, with regard to asthma related morbidity, we know that it's relative to many different factors in the environment. So, the social environment, Issues related to poverty, issues related to crime, issues related to security, the built environment, our housing, the quality of our housing, the quality of our roads, of our cities, the political and economic environment, things like the availability of health insurance, especially for um, people, especially children that have asthma exacerbations, also related to medical care, the natural environment. So if we live in a valley versus a hill, what we're exposed to, and host factors, of course. Um, so genetic predispositions, other things that we may be exposed to by a behavior or inheritance. So one of the major questions in asthma-related morbidity, as in many chronic diseases, is that if these are all important, how do we figure out where to intervene on? How do we figure out how these interact? And how do we do this in statistical models with usually limited data that we have that we've collected that are rich enough to answer these types of questions? So again, this question for understanding factors relating to asthma-related morbidity and how to prevent them has been a really fruitful question that's been keeping me going. So early in my thinking, um, in the community I was working in in Oakland, California, um, it's really hard to not notice that um, poor social economic environments are often coincident with poor natural environments. And this is kind of the premise of the environmental injustice movement that's going on both in the United States and the world. But thinking about this causally, it's been really challenging to think about what's the right relationship? What direction do these arrows go in or should they go in? So for example, can we think of socioeconomic position as a confounder between air pollution and asthma, mor asthma morbidity? Is socioeconomic position potentially a mediator or a modifier that modifies the relationship between air pollution and asthma-related morbidity? Or is it the other way around? Is it factors related to the social environment that's the true causal factor? Then we think about air pollution maybe as a two-hit hypothesis, and air pollution mediates the relationship between socioeconomic position and asthma-related morbidity. Unfortunately, I have not come up with answers to these questions, but again, these got me thinking about how to handle these types of research questions when you have so many factors that are coincident in the prevalence and um, morbidity related to chronic disease. So for those of you who were in environmental, I'm sorry, epi discussion group, is that still going on? Cool, okay. Epi discussion group about four or five years ago, I presented some of my dissertation work using causal inference models. Um, my biggest memory from that day is I was early in my pregnancy and I was really trying hard not to throw up <laughs> that day. Um, just thought I'd share that, but it turned out okay. Um, 
I didn't grow up. And, I, and it, my daughter was born, so there you go. Okay, so anyway, when I started graduate school, there's a lot of interest in causal inference and understanding the counterfactual. If you happen to be in Dr. Carlton's environmental epi class, I'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. So the idea is really how do we isolate a causal effect especially in observational studies. Again, when we have all these factors that are coincident. And this class of causal inference mo um, models called marginal structural models promise to get at that with this idea of the counterfactual. So this idea is that what we observe in reality is this one representation of how these covariates may act together. And really there are dozens of combinations, hopefully that are observed, that these covariates may act together. So the issue here in the particular community I was working in, Oakland, California, is that we came up with some via major violations um, for the assumptions of this model, namely the, environment, the experimental treatment assignment assumption, and sociologists call this non-positivity. So this idea that we can create an observed counterfactual if we have some representation of these co variant combinations in real life. Unfortunately, in the situation we were looking at with Oakland, when I was trying to understand the causal effect of residential proximity to closed access freeways, on emergency department visits for asthma, we didn't have a combination of covariates that represented all possibilities. Mostly, children who are African American tended to live closer to the freeways, and children who are white tended to live further freeway. So we didn't have a, a counterfactual represented in our observed data, thus violating the major assumptions of this model. So just to give some early thinking about this model, so really what we're looking for in causal inferences is ulti ultimate causal parameter, which is someone's experience given an exposure and then someone's experience when they don't have that exposure, which is impossible to get unless you have a time machine. So what we're usually left with in epidemiology is a group level causal <coughs> parameter, and which is again really hard to, to get because we don't really have an exact representation of a counterfactual for a group that's exposed compared to a group that's not exposed. So what we're left with is a traditional regression parameter, which is basically what is the experience given exposure of an outcome given exposure, all of their covariates held constant, and we subtract out, we either use a ratio or a difference of what the outcome would be positive if that exposure did not happen given a set of covariates. And the problem that we have with confounding is that usually those covariates have a deterministic relationship with whether someone has the exposure or not. So in this study in Oakland, I've been working with my postdoc, Ryan Gann, who's a graduate of the epi department here, and using a traditional regression parameter, we've come up with a, um, call, a, a relationship between nitrogen dioxide, usually a good marker for freeway-related pollution, and um, controlling for all covariates in the model. So it's, there's a pretty substantial relationship between exposure to nitrogen dioxide and emergency department visits. It's not significant. However, we tried using this with a counterfactual potentials outcome parameter using um, targeted maximum likelihood estimation. And there we got a pretty similar effect estimate with a, um, oh, that's good, <laughs> a confidence signal that does not include one. But the interpretation of this parameter is very different than a traditional regression. So if you remember, traditional regression is what is the factor of the exposure on the outcome. All other factors held constant, so stratified, basically. And a TMLE estimate or a causal estimate is what would have happened had everyone, what would have been the causal parameter had everyone been exposed to the freeway compared to if no one was exposed to the freeway. And we know, again, because of this violation of the ETA assumption, that this isn't really possible in environmental epidemiology because of the social nature of the patterning of the exposures that we have. Okay, so here I was kind of stuck. I'm like, huh, there goes one dissertation. What am I going to do? Okay, so the next step is thinking about hopping on the causal inference bandwagon, which is really fun and great. But is that the type of question that we want to ask? Do I want to isolate the effect of air pollution or socioeconomic status or building or is the goal really to look at everything that someone's exposed to and try to understand a total environmental approach versus one thing at a time? Trying to find the causal parameter for one exposure at a time could be helpful in terms of policy and trying to figure out how to control something, but it doesn't really capture this idea that we're not exposed to one thing. We're not exposed to just our socioeconomic status or just traffic-related air pollution or poor building quality. So in thinking about mixtures, and because I know this is partially sponsored by the lead, the lead group, um, I decided to put up not a piece of chocolate cake. <laughs> My French is terrible, so I'll let Donna <laughs> translate for that. But, um, and taking off from a uh, favorite artist, Magritte. So if you look at this, you can say, okay, well, if that's not a piece of chocolate cake, what is it? 
Well, it depends on the research question you ask, right? This could be what we consider a mixture, right? If, you are research, if your research question is asking, what is good about this chocolate cake? Usually in Epi, we don't ask that. We ask, what is bad about this chocolate cake, right? <laughs> so we can think about, well, there's probably a lot of fat in it. There's probably some gluten that might not be good. There's probably the combination. If we cook with a lot of butter, that probably not, is not good for us. But there can be good things for us too. There can be the antioxidant properties in chocolate. Okay, but the question is really, what is this in the context of the research question that we have, right? So are we trying to understand, hmm, what is the most salient way to get antioxidant delivery into um, our, <laughs> our diet? Or, you know, looking, this is a whole piece. Is this a mixture of things that are not good with us? Is there some kind of synergy between the ingredients in here? We know there is chemically, right? There's leavening agents, there's delicious fats, and there's chocolate, and it's oh so good. So the question here for mixtures relates to nutritional epidemiology just as much as it does to environmental epidemiology, which is that we're not exposed to these factors that we're interested in isolation. So one of the issues is that our statistical models are really built to understand these factors in isolation, controlling for all other things, holding them constant. So what's the question that we're trying to ask here? And again, this not only applies to nutritional epi, but environmental epidemiology as well. So one of the que research questions I work on is the health effects of diesel exhaust. And diesel exhaust in and of itself is a complex mixture. It's one component of air pollution. It sources diesel engines. But within diesel exhaust, there's alkanes, there's elements, there's PAHs, there's volatile organic, organic compounds. So these compounds may be hundreds of classes of chemicals in and of itself. So this is a giant mixture. And the reason I have jelly beans up there is that when we do community education on diesel exhaust, we talk about jelly beans being the model for what diesel exhaust is. There's stuff in the jar. There's all these components and particles that may not be the same and that re represent this great mixture. So that, again, leads us to the question, what is the research question? What are we trying to do? Why are mixtures important to understand? So... There was excellent timing a couple years ago where um, NIEHS sponsored a workshop and several people from Denver were there. Um, statistical approaches for assessing health effects of environmental chemical mis mixtures in epidemiology studies, which is a really cool place where a lot of researchers, particularly statisticians and biostatisticians, highlighted these approaches for understanding complex mixtures in environmental studies. However, what I didn't realize is that people do not have the same definition of mixtures. So generally at this workshop, it was agreed upon that there were three main definitions of mixtures, or what we're trying to understand about mixtures. So one of them was this bad actors approach. So that could be if you have a very complex set of exposures, what in that complex set is driving the health effect? So a lot of examples that you see in the literature relating to the bad actors are something like PCB congeners and adverse <laughs> um, pregnancy outcomes, where there's a lot of different PCGB, PCB congeners um, that may have these effects, but it's hard to balance given limits of detection, characterization of all these PCBs about which one is the bad one, which one is really driving the health effects in the context of everything else that someone's exposed to. So the second mixture issue that people think about are sources and policy remediation. This idea that if we can use these mixtures as a signal for... Um, a source, for example, if you have an asphalt plant that may have a very different chemical signature than something like a roadway. So can you use the chemical signature of a particular process to identify what that source is and the potentially controlling for that source? And exposure scientists have had a way to deal with this for a long time using positive matrix factorization, which is really good at kind of using these chemical combinations to create these signatures of sources. And again, that's thought to be a very handy tool for policy. But the last part, the total environment, is what I was really interested in. And again, getting back to that question about Oakland, if you have all these factors that are going on, you have limited amounts of ways to collect data and time to collect data, how do you determine what's really driving the relationship? And that could be basically about this total environment. Because again, people don't experience one part of their environment at a time. So after kind of going down the causal inference path, I decided to go down the total environment path a little bit. OK, so generally, how do we think about capturing joint effects? You know, it's first day of epi for many of you. So we have tools at Epi that are quite good, right? We have effect modification and interaction. So I wanted to um, highlight this paper that was done by Brianna Moore when she's a postdoc at CSU that looked at heat-related deaths. Actually, these were heat-coded deaths 
in Oklahoma and trying to understand joint effects with temperature exposure and other exposures that may have been happening either at the personal level or at the ambient level. And Brianna followed the, who was it? A Vanderbilt paper very well and presented four by two tables. And I just wanted to highlight looking at outdoor heavy, um, if uh, people participate in outdoor heavy, la la um, heavy labor occupation, there is both a multiplicative effect and a, a increased risk due to interaction, so an additive effect of both increased temperature as well as um, working outdoors had a substantially increased odds ratio of death in this population. Okay. So again, these are things that we learn in EPI. They're tools at our disposal. They're great tools. This is not a talk to say, don't ever do effect modification or interaction studies. But they do have their limitations. So the motivation for trying to find new methods to try to understand this multiple or joint effects for total environment is that one, it's challenging to make inference with highly correlated predictor variables. And we know we have a lot of things that we're exposed to in the environment, especially chemical pollutants, do tend to be correlated. They tend to travel together. It's difficult to isolate important predictors. And it, we have an unwieldy parameter space with low power beyond two-way interactions, right? So we might have a lot of questions and our data might not be appropriate for answering these questions. So this is just an opportunity to try some new methods and do some new things. So I'm going to talk about the first of three case studies. So this is case study 1A, <laughs> diesel exhaust exposure in the Duwamish study. And two shots of Mount Rainier, one in a beautiful August day in Seattle and one in a not so beautiful December day in Seattle. Um, the two, two time periods we did our campaign, so you can imagine that there's different things going on in the air at each of the time. So the study area here was in the Duwamish Valley in, um, in Seattle, Washington. The Duwamish is a super fun site. It's characterized by a lot of water pollution, mostly from the industrial processes related to shipbuilding and manufacturing that happened there prior to World War I and on. And there's other things that go on there as well. For example, the port of Seattle is there, so it's the major seaport of Seattle. The major waste transfer station for Seattle is there. Major school bus depot for the city school district is there too. And these um, areas have within them residential neighborhoods where the residents feel like they were getting more than their fair share of exposure to diesel exhaust, not only from the um, ships, but from the trucks that service this port, from the trains, from all the waste transfer station and school bus depots. So this was a collaborative effort. Julie Fox is an exposure scientist. Jill Schulte was our awesome master student, and Asaf Arun is our biostatistician for this project. So the question that we asked is, how can we, how can we develop a surface for this neighborhood level to determine if people are getting exposed to diesel exhaust at their homes? There was a lot of complaint that there was not zoning in this part of Seattle, so trucks were entering residential neighborhoods, and diesel trucks take a long time to fire up, so they would fire up at 5 o'clock in the morning, make a lot of noise, and also emit a lot of pollution. So... Unfortunately, there's not really a great way to actually specifically measure diesel exhaust. As I said before, it's a mixture of a lot of different things. So there's, um, we went out into the field and we measured a bunch of different things. So one nitropyrene is a nitro PAH. That's a pretty specific marker for diesel. It's not super well established in the literature. Oh, that moved without me. Okay. Um, but it's a good marker. It's emitted about 20 times more in diesel engines than in gasoline engines. So we use some other markers for just general combustion including light-absorbing light carbon, which is um, black carbon, and it's basically a good measure of diesel also, but is generally related to combustion sources. Oxides of nitrogen, as I mentioned, is a pretty good road indicator, but it's not specific to diesel. And fine particulate matter, PM2.5, which is just a general marker of combustion, so not as specific as 1MP. So we wanted to measure all of these and see what happened. It turns out that the PM 2.5 surface for the neighborhood was fairly flat. It's really hard to get a good intra-urban signal for PM 2.5, but we did get good signals for our other markers using land use regression. So these are three maps, one with nitropyrene, predi one nitropyrene predictions, one with light-absorbing carbon predictions, and one with NOx predictions. The NOx are use, um, we use passive badges to measure. The other ones required active monitoring. So we were able to have about 118 NOx badges going through the Duwamish Valley up to downtown Seattle, while we were limited because of um, the need for active sampling for the other two um, sources. You can see these are, you know, they're fairly similar. However, they are a little bit different. And being, this, uh, being that this was a community study, the goal was actually to communicate to the residents what we found. 
So it was really a challenge to think about, well, what do we tell them? Do we give them the nitropyrene map? Do we give them the NOx map? Do we give them the light absorbing carbon map? So Asaf, our biostatistician, came up with a pollution score, doing this through singular value decomposition, which is basically a matrix, matrix factorization of all the components, these five comp four components, I'm sorry, we had for our, our pollution that we measured through the sampling campaign. So the idea here is that you log transform these and you scale them, and then you, they're a linear combination of all the covariates. And what we ended up here is with an average pollution score. So here's the challenge where this is kind of our mixture, right? It's indicating NOx, it's indicating one nitropyrene, it's indicating black carmine. Does it mean anything? Well, does it, again, it depends what your research question is. This approach allowed us to identify pretty much on a street-by-street -street level where high pollution was relative to low pollution. And it gave, the, it gave really kind of a comprehensive view of all the data we collected rather than presenting it one by one. So we like this SVD <coughs> approach. And it, it, I think, had some traction in the community about this high pollution score versus a low pollution score in terms of combining everything that we had. So that was basically like creating an index of all the pollution sources, all the pollution compounds that we measured. So this led into the second study that we did in Seattle, and this is uh, spatiotemporal analysis of environmental contributions to subclinical COPD exacerbation. Wow, that's a, woo, I need a drink after that one, hang on. <laughs> so this was actually an epi study, in, as opposed to just a exposure assessment study. So the study area, again, was Puget Sound, Washington, King County, and Pierce County, which includes Seattle and Tacoma. And this is working with Vincent Fan, who's a pulmonologist at the VA at Puget Sound. And again, Asaf helped out on this study. And this study was a little bit different in the sense that we gave 35 veterans a GPS-enabled inhaler, which is displayed there, and asked them to carry around their inhaler for three months. And every time they had a COPD exacerbation, they deployed their inhaler. So we had a nice timestamp for every time that they used their inhaler, which we thought was a good marker of subclinical exacerbations. Unfortunately, this was the first iteration of this instrument, and the location stamp didn't work very well. So we only had about 30% of our GPS coordinates, but we had all of our time of our timestamps. Uh, most of our timestamps were available for this analysis. So again, what we did here is use the. Um, if you see kind of where the, the pin drop is there, we use a central site monitor in Seattle at the Beacon Hill Monitoring Site that collected a wide range of pollutant measures for the study area. So we had PM2.5, PM10, so the kind of coarser measures of um, particulate matter, elemental carbon and organic carbon, also thought to be um, considered part of particulate matter that may have an etiologic effect on health. It's unclear at this point. Nitrogen dioxide, again, a good marker for traffic-related air pollution. Ozone, and I want to point out the two indices at the bottom. Yep, I did circle them. The AQI and the WACA. So the AQI is an index created by EPA that basically is a combination of pollutants. So it's five criteria pollutants, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, PM 2.5, um, carbon monoxide, I said that, and um, NOx. Thank you. Did I say NOx? Ozone. Ozone. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> So it's basically this index that is almost similar to what we're trying to create with our singular value decomposition score. This index is mostly used to inform residents about the air quality in their neighborhood. And it's not really used extensively for research purposes. And there's probably several reasons for that. One is that pollutants, the criteria air pollutants, are all regulated as single pollutants. So for example, someone looks at the PM 2.5 level, if it's above 35, that's out of attainment. And if it's below 35, it's within attainment, 35 micrograms per meter cubed. So the idea here is that the AQI is in and itself an index and this mixture, but again, it's really used for information purposes rather than research purposes. And the WACA, which is the Washington Air Quality Advisory, is a very similar index that's a little more stringent than the AQI because the Washington Department of Ecology wanted to in think the AQI was stringent enough. So again here, you have uh, the Puget Sound area tends to be very low pollution. So there weren't a whole lot of days that we, um, where we had study participants that had these high levels of pollution. So we, um, what we did here is do a, um, a Poisson regression, mixed level, accounting for individual, and counting the days in the study period 
and the counts of day, the counts on it for each day where people were deploying their inhaler. And we ran that through a, again, a regression analysis, adjusting for individual level covariates, and did that individually for each of the pollutants. In addition to running another singular value de decomposition to come up with this pollution score, and another element in singular value in a singular value to go, oh, sorry, singular variable decomposition called this hot and dry. So those are temporal um, covariates that indicated whether the temperature, wind speed, temperature, wind direction, humidity, indicated whether during the season it was an unseasonably hot and dry day, which is very different than thinking about the pollution levels in that day. So what we came up with, we have the unadjusted um, rate ratios and the adjusted, again, for these individual level covariates, and PM10 was our strongest signal. So you can look at these, if you're non-air pollution epidemiologist, generally you look at this rate ratio and you're like, oh, 1.06, that's really low. But remember, everyone's exposed to air pollution. So if you think about it on a population level, this has a meaningful and significant effect with the amount of people that are exposed to an inter, uh, increase in the one standard deviation of PM10. However, we did also see increased, uh, significant increases based on our indices, both the federal and the state indices, as well as our singular value de decomposition scores. Pollution, um, the pollution score, SVD1, and then the hot dry score, SVD2. Although the conference intervals do cross, um, do include one, we use a fairly lax uh, false discovery rate p-value just to make sure that we are not missing any um, effects. So here again, PM10, which is a mixture in and of itself and very unique to the signal of the combustion sources or the um, anthropogenic and biogenic sources in the area, does show a significant effect with increased exacerbations for a COPD population. But here, too, we also see that this combination of pollutants, which the SVD does include pretty similar pollutants to the AQI and the WACA, that um, results in an increased health effect due to air pollution. So... That's air pollution in and of itself, not everything about air pollution. But again, air pollution is, has its own mixture of challenges as it is. One of the things that we're very fortunate with in studying air pollution is that there are federal and state monitors that provide data for us, which is a huge boon to the research endeavor for people to understand the health effects of air pollution. But it's not, again, it's not perfect. Okay, we do have misclassification of exposure because these are area-based monitors and it's hard to tell where people are and what they're exposed to day to day, especially as they move outdoors to indoors. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, our case study too, which is the assessment of joint effects of pesticides and air pollution and pediatric asthma. So this is adding another domain to understanding ambient exposures and their relationship to respiratory disease. So the study area for this study, um, first, uh, we're actually working in Yakima Valley, Washington. There's a lot of valleys in this study, if you get it. Air pollution just likes to sit in valleys, so don't live in a valley. Okay. And the grad students that are working on this project are um, Wanda Benica Coca, Rachel Severson, and Lauren Heck is a PhD student in statistics. So for the first part of the study, we actually borrowed data from collaborator Catherine Carr at University of Washington, had an aggregating factors of asthma in rural environment study, or AFAIR funded. So the interesting thing about asthma is that most of our pediatric asthma data comes from urban centers, from amazing places like National Jewish, which has a lot of great data, but also Ten places that have a lot of pollution, places like Los Angeles, like Boston and Eastern Seaborne cities that have a very unique profile of air pollution. And there's not as much data out there on um, asthma and asthma exacerbations for more rural populations, especially populations that live in agricultural areas that may have a very different exposure profile compared to an urban population. So part of the inspiration for this study came from some work I did with Rachel Renan and Brenda Eskenazi's group at um, at Berkeley. So they have another study called Chimacos, which is in the Salinas Valley in California, that has been really focused on pesticide exposure and neurocognitive effects in both mothers and children. So Rachel's paper focused on lung function and exposure to um, organophosphate uh, pesticides measured in their urine by uh, dialkylphosphate metabolites, and found that there was a significant relationship between in utero exposure as measured through the mother's urine of DAPs and lung function at seven years old. So this was pretty interesting. Most of the things that we know about pesticide and respiratory illness come from the occupational literature, where we do see these um, effects of 
usually pesticide poisonings and very unfortunate events. So the question here is like, what about these chronic low levels of exposure pesticides? And do these have ex um, effects on offspring who aren't necessarily exposed, maybe primary as working in the fields, but maybe secondary or tertiary through their parents' experience occupationally? So one of Rachel's um, takeaways here was that we found a significant effect of air pollution, but she didn't really think about other things that people are exposed to, um, namely air pollution. So what Catherine's study allowed us to do in the Yakima Valley, Valley was take actually urinary metabolites of um, organophosphate exposure and look at ozone and PM 2.5 collected from central site monitors in the Yakima Valley. So this is um, some data from Juan Day's paper. He's also presented it at ISEE. So these are the beta estimates for the association between LTE4, of leukotriene 4, which is a good marker, of, urinary marker of, um, <laughs> Alice, thanks for nodding, Alice, <laughs> for uh, pulmonary exacerbation in children with asthma, and trying to understand that relationship with EDAP, so another urinary metabolite for organophosphate exposure, ozone, and PM2.5. So these are the beta change in urinary LTE4 concentrations for one IQR chain increase in the pollutant exposure level, and these all have um, controlled for the other pollutants. So these are just the um, main effects, and we could see that ozone and PM had an elevated but non-significant effect on urinary LTE4, while the uh, urinary OPs had a significant elevated effect. So one of the approaches was, well, how do we take all this information and put it together? So what one day did was want to look at pesticides, air pollution, and asthma using the information that we had, but kind of in a, I don't want to call it an overly simplistic model, but in a way that people could actually understand what's going on. So this was um, just graphing the PM2.5 concentrations and the ozone concentrations for the study period that we have. These are repeated measures over 16 kids that were enrolled in the study. And I wanted to point out uh, a panel on this is PM2.5, and we see a little blip that goes above what the, um, the EPA standard is. And we actually wrote another paper on that, oddly enough. That is related to wildfires in 2012 in Washington State. And Ryan um, Gann has a publication on that that's in GeoHealth. But anyway, just getting back to our setting point, is that trying to understand, taking advantage of these daily fluctuations in PM2.5 and ozone, can we understand in a panel study, in a longitudinal study, what the effects on these short-term markers of respiratory inflammation were. So what Wande wanted to do was try to understand just by using median splits, what difference we would see if we looked at, for example, for DAPs, for a high level of DAPs and a high level of ozone versus a high level of DAPs and a low level of ozone. So basically what he did is use median splits for all the observed data and categorize them in two-way interactions, in three-way exposure categories using high, moderate, and low, and then in four-way exposure categories. So the four-way exposure category is all the way down here. So for example, if you had low, below the median for ozone, PM2.5, and DAPS, you were classified as low. If you had high, let's see, high ozone or high PM2.5, or high OPs, you were considered mild. If you had two factors, you were considered moderate, and if you had all three factors, you were considered high exposure. So basically, this looks like interaction, right? So it's just another way to handle interaction. And what one they found, again, remember that this is a very small sample size, but we actually did see meaningful results. I'm going to point to you to that panel down there, which is that if you have high of everything versus low of everything for all those three factors, you have a greater degree of LTE4, a marker of this um, lung exacerbation, compared to if you had mild versus low. It's not a very nice dose-response relationship, but there are strong hints that in there that having more of this stuff, having higher levels of all three, is worse for you than having just higher levels of two or having high levels of one. So this is a our first attempt at trying to understand this mixtures approach using not only air pollution as a domain, but pesticides as a domain as well. And the reason we wanted to do that specifically is because the bulk of the study of this um, NIHSK award is being done in the San Joaquin Valley, not in Washington, sorry, California. So if anyone's from California or just nationally thinking about, um, the San Joaquin Valley is one of the most fertile agricultural um, regions in the country, if not the world. And so there's, um, to protect our food supply, we have very high level of pesticide use there. 
But also, in addition, San Joaquin Valley is a valley. So air pollution coming from the west coast of California just kind of sits there. In addition to having two major freeways that go through the Central Valley that have a lot of traffic-related air pollution going by. So the San Joaquin Valley, especially Fresno, has been an area for a lot of asthma-related studies over the years. And we felt this was a good opportunity to not only look at the air pollution component of environmental exposures, but the pesticide component as well. So how do we, again, hold these joint exposures? So this is my very crude rubric for trying to understand how do we look at these things together at one time. So let's say we're looking at lung function, which is the outcome of interest in this study. So we think about, in irregular regression, lung function is a function of air pollution with all other covariates held constant. This is our usual statistical model. In Rachel's paper, we looked at pesticides related to air pollution with all other covariates held constant. But again, thinking about a total environmental approach, the idea is that we want to look at pesticides and air pollution, but not air pollution levels held constant, air pollution levels as people in the community are experiencing them. And, for, and kind of if you flip that around, we do want to do the same thing. We want to look at the pesticide levels in the context of air pollution levels as people are experiencing them. So, in a sense, we want to do almost what Wande is kind of approaching um, to do. And this is where this NIEHS workshop and these kind of real excitement about mixtures have come into play. So we want to be able to look at the difference between <coughs> someone has high air pollution exposure and low pesticides versus high pesticides, low air pollution, high air pollution and medium pesticides in the context of other fixed covariates and look at those effects on lung function. So how do we do it? There's a lot of approaches out there. There's a lot of kind of fun, cool, new things that are going on. And there are some really old things that we're doing and readapting to these mixture approaches. So for example, I'm going to very talk very about profile regression, non-parametric base shrinkage, and tree-based methods like CART. So for example, to try to get at these joint exposures, the one solution would be to perform regressions on exposure profiles instead of each predictor variable. So instead of having those one covariate at a time in our model, we look at them in groups or profiles. And we use some Bayesian techniques to actually create these groups and to understand what the difference is between if someone has high of a group versus low versus medium. So that technique is called profile regression, and its um, main developer has been John Mulder at Oregon State and has been really using this to understand mostly air pollution. But that doesn't mean that we can't put other domains of exposure in there. So the solution, too would be to penalize the sum of their regression coefficients, which is very stat talky to me, which is this idea that we take, if we have a parameter, we can basically shrink that parameter to zero or close to zero so we can understand the importance of the effect of that specific parameter on the outcome. So there's many methods to do this in um, statistics and in biostatistics. So for example, if you're using shrinking the absolute sum, that's the lasso technique. And people think about these as a variable selection model. And if you're um, trying to minimize a squared outcome, that's ridge regression, which we've used in a couple of studies. And this idea of shrinkage is that you're basically setting a prior probability for what you think the covariates look like, hopefully based on real data. And this um, technique has been put forth by Amy Herring. Um, I think she's at NC State now. Um, Non-parametric Bayesian shrinkage. Again, because you have priors that help inform how to kind of reduce those covariates to zero. So Lauren, who's our uh, awesome stat student, created an R package called Mix Model Pack and has basically created that you can input your data and do both profile regression and non-parametric Bayesian shrinkage. We just got our data, so maybe you'll invite me back next year and I can tell you how everything <laughs> worked out. But again, one of the hard things about implementing these, um, these techniques is that they tend to be very stat heavy. And for those of us that maybe like our numbers in number form rather than Greek letter forms, can be a little intimidating. So by creation of these packages, we want to make these open to everyone for use in, um, in studies. So this is in beta right now, but Lauren's going to publish this through soon. And it's available on her GitHub page. If you want to play around with it, I can let you know that. So in addition to that, one of the reasons we're working in California is that California has extensive data on pesticide use and application, especially for agricultural pesticides. It's one of two states in the country that actually has a pesticide use registry, Washington State being the other one. So Rachel created another R package called PUR exposure, so that's pesticide use registry. So for every address in California, we can estimate pounds of pesticides, classes of pesticides applied through various buffers for each address that's available using the land use um, plats that are available through the state. So having these two packages together and being in California really obviates some of the work that we need to do in pesticide research. That being said, um, 
These are, again, our ecological level covariates, so it's really unclear what an individual level exposure would be to pesticides, especially given diet and other behaviors and other maybe household behaviors, which is another part of the study. So this is really exciting. And again, hopefully I'll have some details on that soon. Okay, the last case study I'll talk about is the Wisconsin Children's Blood Levels and Educational Outcomes. This was my first uh, postdoc grant. So switching to lead, gears very quickly, sorry about that. <laughs> So, as we know, lead is still a problem, especially for environmental justice communities. And there's so much lead in the upper Midwest because lead paint tended to stick better in the cold weather. So every county in Wisconsin actually has lead prevalence and children that continue to be exposed to lead. However, if you notice, the southeast corner of Wisconsin, which is where the urban counties of Milwaukee, Racine are, and tend to have the highest level of lead prevalence in the, in the state, with also other environmental factors that are contributing to poor children's health. So we did a project called CLEO, again, the Children's Lead Levels and Educational Outcomes. And the research goal here was to investigate the association of moderate elevated blood levels and performance on a, the fourth grade Wisconsin standardized test, the WKCE. So our hypothesis, and this was a huge switch for me because I'm not a lead person, I'm not a neurocognitive person. I got to my postdoc and I'm like, what can I do with asthma? And they said, nothing. I'm like, okay, what can I do now then? <laughs> so, what it came to me is that the problems associated with asthma, if you remember that DAG I put it up in the beginning, are the exact same problems that we have with lead. We have an environmental exposure, we have socioeconomic context that it's very hard to tease apart. So that hypothesis here is that cognitive effects as measured by these scores on the standardized exam or inversely related to elevated and untreated blood lead levels. We started this project in 2008 and the reason we chose this um, blood level, 10 to 20 micrograms per deciliter, is that the current CDC level of action was 10. Um, but the state of Wisconsin didn't have appropriate remediation tools for families and with children that had elevated but not level but not above 20. So basically, these kids were told that they'd elevated blood levels, but were given no remediation or interventions that could help them reduce the negative effects of lead. So this was a statewide study um, that ended up being about uh, mostly Milwaukee and Wisconsin and coordinating between the university, the Wisconsin partner Department of Public Instruction and the Department of Health Services. So this is actually not a mixtures approach, but it's a very cool approach. It's called quantitative um, and quantile regression. So this idea here is that if you have a linear outcome, and if we think about BMI, if we think about weight, if we think about blood pressure, if we think about here in terms of test scores, that the relationships between the covariates and the outcome might not be the same at every level of the outcome. Um, depending on what other things are going on. And a lot of this is unmeasured variables. So the response of Y to X1 or X2 depends on the beta parameters via this gamma position, on the position of the observation I and the distribution of the observables. Like, wait, I actually wrote that. And sometimes I think, what does that actually mean? So it's usually, it's a lot easier to explain with data. So I'll do that now. So anyway, quantile regression is a nice alternative to other techniques we have, like ordinary least squares, where we're not really interested in trying to get the mean effect, but we want to look at the effect at different points in the distribution. So this comes a lot, again, in terms of, of weight, especially if we think about birth weight. We might be really interested in the kids that are the very low percentiles of birth weight as very high, where we usually are addressing this media, this, I'm sorry, um, mean effect, where in terms of public health and etiology, we want our understanding to be with the kids on the tail ends. Okay, so this is just a, a graph that illustrates what an OLS regression looks like, and that's illustrated by the red line, so it's just flat for the whole distribution of the outcome versus kind of the confidence interval and the squiggly lines, which represent the quantile regression at different points. So these were estimated at um, 0.1 quantiles across the distribution of test scores. So we had the normal covariates in the model. We had whether they were lead exposed. We had whether they were black. We had whether they were male or female, whether their parents rated them in excellent health, um, whether their parents had less than a high school education, whether the State Department of Public Instruction considered them below poverty level, and whether they were English language learners. So here's um, the effect estimates. So again, OLS, we have basically the mean scores of what all these parameter effects are on the, um, on the outcome, which is here 
the, the reading scores. But then we can estimate the effects of each of these parameters at specific quantiles. So here's an example I picked that it's the 10th quantile, the median, the 50th quantile, and the 90th quantile. So for example, we could see that effect of males, although not significant, changes, changes dramatically depending on where you are on the test score distribution. If you're in the low end, being male has a much higher effect than if you're on the high end. Again, that was not significant, but if you can look at black, which did have a significant score, there's a 10 point difference between kids who scored at the 10th percentile of reading scores versus those that scored at the 90th. So one of the cool things about quantile regression too is that like uh, ordinary least square regression or logistic regression, you can also include interaction terms. So I just wanted to give an example of looking at interaction term. And here we interacted whether the parents had less than a high school education with whether the child was exposed to lead or not. So again, here we have the OLS estimate. And basically, it's not significant. But the parent less than high school education, the interaction term is not significant, where the individual exposure and parent less than high school education parameters are significant. But I want to change your, uh, just draw your attention to the 0.1 quantile and the interaction term for less than, parent less than high school education and exposure. So that's huge, right? So basically, if you had a parent less than high school education and you were exposed to lead, you tended, and you were in the, that first quantile of scores, you scored about 58 points compared to parent, a child who had only one of those factors. And again, that changes depending where you are on the distribution of test scores. So this is a really powerful tool and kind of, again, really handy if you're trying to understand differences in how these covariates interact at different points in the contribution, and different points in the distribution. So where did this lead us? Again, not being a lead person and knowing Milwaukee and the Southeast Wisconsin area, we're really curious about other factors that we know that children are exposed to in the area. And I was really, I'm happy to announce here that um, our team at CSU, which includes Shantanu Jafar in civil, um, in sorry, mechanical engineering, Ellison Carter in civil and environmental in engineering, Andrew Wilson in statistics, and Janine Dilworth Bart in the human development and family studies at the University of Wisconsin, was awarded um, an EPA star grant to look at total natural, total environmental framework using built natural and social environment to assess lifelong health effects of chemical exposures. We just got this announcement two weeks ago, so we are thrilled that EPA is still up and running. Um, <laughs> so our study is called the Southeast Wisconsin Interdisciplinary Study of Children's Health, Ecological Exposure, and Social Environment, which gets shortened to the acronym Swiss Cheese, which is very funny if you're from Wisconsin. <laughs> and here's basically our question here. So we'll, re we'll be working with the state here, with the same agencies that we were working for with the CLIO study, and we have 17,000 kids who are either enrolled in Medicaid, WIC, and have a lead test as part of the state. So one of our objectives, again, using this total environmental framework is to understand the independent and joint contribution of the chemical, social, and physical environmental exposures on children's health outcomes. So that includes built environment, social factors like crime, air quality, as well as um, availability of health and access to health care. The objective, too, is trying to understand if the social and physical environment modify, modifies chemical health dose response relationship. And our objective three is because of the longitudinal nature of these data is that we'll be able to follow these children over time and try to understand the impact of residential mobility on these outcomes. So working with the state, the long-term goal is um, to try to design programs that actually help children in their early developmental stages because mothers can enroll in WIC during pregnancy. So we feel like in terms of a DOHAD hypothesis and an early life trajectory that this is a very important um, time period to capture. In terms of trying to understand what method do we use, we have all these methods that we're at our disposal. Again, I think we're going to try this total environmental profiles approach using singular value decomposition. <laughs> so trying to look at community social environment, community physical environment, individual chemical environment, community chemical environment, and these individual non-modifiable risk factors, mostly sex and race ethnicity, to try to understand how these profiles impact the life trajectories. And because we have Medicaid data, we're going to focus on, we have the opportunity to look at not only respiratory, but neurocognitive outcomes as well as injury outcomes in the cohort. Okay, so conclusions. So mixtures has multiple definitions and multiple contexts. And like most things in epidemiology, it depends what you mean. So make sure if you're thinking about mixtures, 
we have different approaches and different ways we think about this. And again, that really kind of begets what kind of tools we use to approach these pictures. There's a lot of tools out there, and some of them are very, again, like using an interaction term, very good to use in epidemiology. As we get into more correlated data and data that tends to be um, when we're looking at kind of not only two-way interaction terms, but three-way interaction terms, sometimes our interaction tools that we all know aren't as sufficient, so we might have some new approaches. Um, and our approach should always be defined by our research question, and it does help to have a lot of data that are both long and wide, like any epidemiology question. So that being said, I hopefully in time, oh, I just want to say thank you to all of the... <laughs> multiple funding sources that we've cobbled together to create this research program and the many excellent collaborators, mentors, students, and postdocs I've been able to work with. And of course, my family, who um, is always supportive, even um, though not patient all the time. So anyway, <laughs> I'd like to open up for questions. Thanks again for inviting me, and I'm, I'm happy to take some questions. from Racine. Oh, cool. So um, funny comment <coughs> question. Comment is that um, they get awards all the time for the taste of the water quality being the best in the country, which is interesting. Hey, hey. Taste only. <laughs> Apparently it's like not part of the equation. But um, and the question <laughs> is um, this is kind of political. So I saw that the Milwaukee Health Commissioner he just got fired for fired left because of the failure to disclose the lead. To, do you guys have like any interaction with him at all? Or? We work with the state because the state holds the, um, the lead database, although Milwaukee's lead reporting does feed into state. <laughs> it's been complicated. I mean, I imagine that there's a lot of political challenges with being in that position, and um, we, do, we have limited. Our hope is to be more involved with the community at the ground level. There's wonderful clinics like the 16th Street Clinic in, that's doing direct service in Milwaukee. Um, I think sometimes, just to be uh, uh, politically correct, I guess sometimes the political nature of some of these appointments are challenging when it comes to health research. So we, we, we try to build those relationships over time. And as you can see, I go back to the well a lot, working with people that I've already <laughs> worked with before. But yeah. Um, there is a huge outbreak, a water outbreak, I forgot, in Milwaukee County. Um, I don't remember if it was crypto or... I think it was crypto. So water, water quality is not something that we actually included because the water treatment has been so diligent after that, recent, that outbreak in the 90s. Yeah. I have a question about when you're using SVD to like make a composite score. Mm -hmm. like for example, in your case study one, um, you're looking at air pollution. And how can you like uh, weight certain components of the score more? Yes. Like you have that one um, measure of air mm -hmm. pollution that was like you know, more predictive. Yes. The other ones that looked at more combustion. And actually the weights in the SVD actually come from that kind of profile. So sometimes weights, as we know through other techniques, can be um, determined by how much um, d your data quality sometimes or your data missingness. And I think compared to SVD, that's where some of the Bayesian techniques may actually be more helpful, where we can set these priors based on how we know the quality of data is. That comes a lot into... Again, this example with the PGCB congeners, if we have data below the limits of detection where we know we can't do good estimates, we can potentially downweight those or get them shrink those parameters because we know that there's issues. So yes, in SVD, the weights come from the process. And in Bayes, we can assign weights based on either subject matter knowledge or our knowledge of the quality of the data. That's a good question. Uh, Cheryl, uh, since you haven't talked about Colorado at all, um, <laughs> can you perhaps describe for those who don't know uh, what we're doing um, in, in the ECHO study Absolutely. in Colorado. And sure. So thanks for bringing that up, Donna. We're not doing mixtures quite yet, which is why I didn't talk about it today. So um, Donna leads a wonderful cohort study called Healthy Start. And as part of the, and I'm going backwards, because basically we're going to do, sorry, too many clicking, really annoying. We're going to do this, basically. <laughs> so Healthy Start is a birth cohort study that was in 2009. Was enrollment start around there? So the idea is that the focus of Healthy Start has really been kind of the expertise of the LEAD Center, which is kind of nutrition and diet and trying to lead to an understanding um, life course adiposity and diabetes development. But through the ECHO, which is the Environmental Influences in Child Health Outcomes Program through NIH, we were one of 35 cohorts that was awarded additional money to build additional exposure assessment 
um, onto the cohort. So given that we have a very unique mixture of air pollutants on the front range, which includes not only traffic, but oil and gas, um, ag development, we have wildfires here, and also we have long-range transport from the West Coast, there's not a whole lot of data out there on the air quality in the Denver metro, where again, a lot of the air pollution studies have really focused on LA and the eastern seaboard. So in terms of our mix in the front range, we think it's pretty unique. And there's not a real clear understanding about how that potential mixture and all those relative sources play into the development of diabetes, obesity, as well as other outcomes that are being collected in ECHO. So yes, this is my first Colorado study. It's very exciting to actually just have to drive 60 miles and fly to Fresno. But, um, <laughs> It's a really amazing opportunity in terms of understanding kind of the role of air pollution in the metro on children's health outcomes. So I appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. Yes. Actually, I have a question about the slide. Sure. Um, so I noticed that when you calculate or when you measured your different pollutants, mm -hmm. it was during different months of the year. Yep. Is there a reason for that? There yeah. is. Yes, that's a great question. So we had two campaigns. In, in ECHO, we're actually going to have four campaigns to try to capture the seasonal variation in pollution. So the reason is, <coughs> excuse me, one, because of funding. So air pollution in August, which is really interesting if you know anything about um, goods movement, which I learned a lot during this study, which is that the Christmas rush for kind of Christmas presents starts in September, oddly enough. Yeah. So all these kind of ships from China come and dock on the West Coast ports, and then all this goods movement basically transports all of our, I don't know if fidget spinners are in anymore, but Legos, and I'm up to my ears in Legos right now, um, basically across. So we wanted to capture what we thought was a low pollution time in Seattle, which was August, and air, um, air tends to be stable and clear. So, and again, before this um, traffic started happening at the port and then the subsequent rail and truck traffic. In December, the weather is quite a bit different, and we wanted to capture the higher PM levels that not only come from traffic, but the decent amount of home heating that's used for residential fuels, especially wood in the Puget Sound area, and um, other sources. There's less um, atmospheric stability in the winter as well. So there tends to be inversions in the winter that kind of trap the PM closer to where people breathe. So the PM levels should be higher. So we wanted to compare those two seasons. So unfortunately, you can see that I have two August predictions and one December prediction here. And it's because our August prediction for um, black carbon didn't work as well. We just kind of got a flat area. So we didn't, we were able, not able to get the, um, the interurban diversity that we were through the other models in August, which was kind of disappointing. So we didn't have the same corollary models for each season that we measured. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks.